Uh, well, first of all, good afternoon to our panelists and to our audience. Um, this webinar is entitled Managing Conflict to Deliver Major Projects. But before we go into the session, um, I think it would be helpful for a few introductions and also for us to uh, set out how we see this session panning out. Uh, so first, may, may I introduce myself, David Weir and Chris Charles. Uh, we are both partners in uh, Fladgate Solicitors Construction Department. Uh, we specialize in construction and engineering law. Uh, we are a sponsor of the Constructing Excellence SECB Awards and have been for a number of years. Um, for what it's worth, I am also a non-executive director of SECB. And um, uh, uh, certainly on behalf of Chris and I, we are uh, uh, delighted to be involved in today's summit as we were to be involved in the um, uh, awards earlier this year. So, the title of the session is Managing Conflict to Deliver Major Projects. So what we're hoping to do today is to share our respected experiences of dealing with conflict in the context of construction and en engineering projects, but in particular, canvas your views on how the legal profession, which is where Chris and I sit, adds value or not to the industry. And in particular, when we are looking at the allocation of risk and dispute resolution. So uh, Chris and I are both thick skinned. We are genuinely interested to hear industry views on the legal side of the, um, uh, of the sector. Uh, we certainly see ourselves as being a part of the construction industry and a part of the construction sector. However, uh, 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 you may see us in a different light. Um, but certainly as our role of, as lawyers, we see it as our primary function when looking at construction projects is to uh, uh, identify risk, ensure that risk is understood by all the parties, and in particular, the person taking on the risk, and to ensure that that person is able to properly manage the risk. And also that the that person is properly rewarded for taking on the risk. So that's how we uh, 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 like, to us, like to approach the pulling together of construction documentation and various contractual relationships. We also um, uh, uh, deal with disputes and we will come on to that in the course of this session. But we see uh, 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 that disputes don't necessarily indicate that the parties and all the project has failed. And what we would like to explore today are, are, are pragmatic ways of dealing with disputes. So, um, may we have the next slide, please? Okay, so as this slide says, we have an hour today. We will hopefully have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, so please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I think as we mentioned at the beginning, that this session is being recorded and it will be available on the, on the awards website next week. And we'll also put a link in the chat box uh, now. So, the panellists. During the awards judging process, we were lucky and fortunate to meet teams for all of the finalists 
in this year's Project of the Year awards. There were two categories, Projects of the Year with a value <clears throat> 10 million plus and Projects of the Year with a value of less than 10 million. So each finalist um, uh, 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 has, without any shadow of a doubt, delivered an outstanding local project as a high profile landmark and they have demonstrated great team working between themselves, the client, the entire supply chain by what became clear collaborative working. So I'm delighted to welcome panelists from all of the finalists. In no particular order, I will uh, uh, introduce our panelists and provide a very brief overview of the project that uh, got them to the finals. So first, Ed Hollis, Lines O'Neill. Um, their um, uh, 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 project was the construction of a new 4FE school building on the site of the existing St. Nicholas Primary School. And their brief was to, was to create additional student capacity and make way for new improved facilities whilst the school remained, remained in occupation throughout. Next, we have Jim McCormack from Jez, Jeffrey Osborne. And that project is the Royal Horticulturist Society Hilltop Building. And this is a new science education and learning center accommod accommodating a herbarium laboratories public engagement space, research facilities and restaurant area. This is the first dedicated horticultural scientific center of excellence designed to protect, to protect the future of plants, people and the planet. We then have Dale Parker from Wilmot Dixon Construction and uh, their project was Green School for Boys. This was the construction and fit out of a new 9,000 meter squared secondary school with six form sports pitch, sports hall, and multi-use games area, and the provision of temporary school facilities. Rari Reeves from Medical Architecture for the Blossom Court St. Anne's Hospital. Blossom Court is a new mental health inpatient building in a constrained urban site at St. Anne's Hospital, which prioritizes independent access to outdoor space to promote patient well-being and recovery and reduce pressure on, an, on NHS staff. Uh, next, we have Jamie Lewis, Multiplex, and their project is 22 Bishopsgate uh, at 62 stories and 278 meters high. 22 Bishops, Bishopsgate is the largest single use building in the UK and the tallest tower in the city of London. Those five, five finalists I mentioned, um, uh, are in the projects over 10 million category. And I will hand you over to my uh, partner, Chris, uh, for the categories below 10 million. Um, thanks, David. Um, uh, as David said earlier this year, we had the privilege of chairing these, these, two, um, uh, the, 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 these two awards. And uh, I, I uh, chaired the judging panel for uh, projects up to 10 million pounds. Um, and we have representatives from each of those um, entrants here today as well. Um, I'll briefly introduce them now. Um, in no particular order, we have Ben Green from WW Martin. Um, uh, their project was the Bennett Memorial Diocesan School, um, which was a uh, substantial uh, extension and uh, refurbishment of the Bennett Memorial School on behalf of Kent County Council. Uh, which included the installation of um, uh, modern new teaching spaces, uh, as well as um, new ICT facilities. Uh, next, we have Andrew Garrett uh, from BJF Group. Um, and uh, BJF undertook the complete uh, remodeling and modern modernization of the Bat and Ball Center uh, in Seven Oaks to provide a modern, uh, sorry, a modern and functional facility uh, for the local community to use. 
Um, next up, we have Matthew Wynn and Associates at Ridgeon Partners. Uh, and their project was for CABI, um, a not-for-profit organisation uh, focused on agricultural and environmental issues around the world. Uh, and that was the construction of a new and modern headquarters in Oxfordshire. Um, Martin Pilcher from RAP Interiors, uh, and their project was a, was a real COVID success story um, and included the design and installation in just seven days uh, of 44 ITU bed bays for COVID patients who were not in uh, intensive care. And that was on behalf of uh, Brentwood and Braintree NHS Trust. Um, uh, and last but by no means least, we have uh, Dave Hughes from Hughes Architects. Uh, uh, and their entry was a development called the, the Underwood in Greenwich, um, which comprised the design and construction of eight uh, modern net zero carbon affordable houses on behalf of the Royal Borough uh, of Greenwich, uh, completely transforming a, a disused backland site um, of derelict garages and hard standing. Um, so a very, very warm welcome to you all, uh, and I think we'll now move on to, to, to the meat of the session. So uh, I'll hand you back to, to David, and uh, next slide, please. Thank you, uh, Chris. Okay, before we ask the audience, we're going to go a little Radio 4 on you, and we're going to have a thought for the day. So, construction operations and conflict have been an aspect of life since the beginning of human existence. However, the origins of lawyers and the first, first founders of law are likely to have made their appearance as recently as ancient Greece and Rome. So on one view, we're relative newcomers to the construction industry. So the thought for the day is, the first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Chris, I will hand it back to you for the poll. Thank you, David. Uh, quoting Shakespeare um, uh, 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 on, a, on a Thursday afternoon. Um, so the poll will open very shortly. And we would like to ask the audience, in simple terms, if you think the legal profession adds value to a construction project. Uh, please choose your answer and submit. Gosh, I have to say, I'm surprised by that. Thank, thank you very much. We've got a very generous and uh, perhaps charitable audience. So we've got the majority, not the majority of people, but 40% saying absolutely lawyers make a substantial contribution to a successful project. So hopefully the, the rest of this session won't be too much of a task to convince you that absolutely we do. Uh, but we do have some people, by the looks of it, who, who we do need to convert to our side. So we've got 30% saying lawyers are essential, but I wouldn't describe them as adding value. Um, uh, no one actually saying lawyers mitigate risk, but are, are a pure cost of the project, which, which I suppose is encouraging. Uh, and, uh, and finally, we've got uh, quite a few people um, saying projects would be better without the lawyers. Well, hopefully throughout this session, we can we can convince you otherwise. But before we move on to consider some of the, some of the issues and the questions we, we want to tackle in this session, I wonder if I could ask um, a few of my panellists for, for their views on that question um, and their views on the legal, com uh, the legal profession's contribution to, to construction projects. So, um, uh, Jamie, uh, purely because you're the first on my screen, maybe I can come to you first. Yeah, no problem at all, Chris. Um, I, I think generally, so at Multiplex, we have our own legal counsel. Um, and I think being part of the company, um, therefore, gives us a, a slightly more positive view on, on the legal profession. Um, the scale of work that Multiplex carry out, and, and particularly so at 22 Bishopsgate, we have um, very high risk, very high value, and generally a very experienced and, and competent client. Um, so I think actually the, the work of the legal profession is, is essential. Um, I think really the key is that they are, um, and you know, if not 
adding pure value, at least giving clarity to the project team to um, mitigate risk or to ensure there's a very clear understanding of the contract that if were not the case, would put the company um, at risk. So I think we've probably got a slightly different, um, a different view given the scale of work that we do and the size of the company we are. Um, as uh, I think for I think the main contract is similar to Multiplex, the the legal side is key, and as a project manager, as a construction manager, on some of these projects, we do obviously understand it's a very wide ranging role, and we do require and we do lean on um, the experts in in the fields in in whatever element, and obviously now uh, legal. So yeah, I think our view is is very much positive. Um, there's always a, uh, a cautionary tale um, about the legal elements going too far. Generally, that's usually aligned when a project's in in quite significant conflict or there's you know deeper issues to it. And unfortunately, I guess from from, from yourself, Chris, you would probably and David, you would probably come involved in it is. Slightly, um, there is an issue on a job, and of course, one, once the, the legal profession get involved, then they're maybe somewhat tired with that brush. Um, but yes, for, for our view, a, a, a key element and a key discipline within uh, the main contracting route that we do. Uh, uh, that, thanks, Jamie. That, that's really interesting, um, uh, and, it, and it's on the, on the one hand, obviously, good to hear that. The legal profession is an integral part of Multiplex's business. Uh, but an interesting comment there at the end about um, uh, the legal profession getting involved and perhaps sometimes taking things too far or, or, or not entirely helping things when when issues arise um, and when you know when, when you get towards formal dispute res- uh, resolution processes. And maybe we can. Um, well, I think we will come on to that in a bit more detail later on in the session. Um, but I wonder then if we can get a slightly different perspective. We've got a few um, uh, a few consultants on the panel as well today. So um, uh, Dave, if, if I come to you for maybe, maybe an architect's uh, view on things. Um, yeah, thanks. It, it's, I mean, this is fascinating for, for me. So as a practice, we generally do smaller projects than the multiplex or the actually most people on the panel and i think one of the issues that a lot of our industry has particularly at the smaller end so you know for your for your real big players like multiplex scanska you know all of that sort of thing the, uh, you, it's far you you would expect them to be regularly engaging with the legal profession i think where we struggle maybe where the legal profession struggles is at the smaller end trying to sell yourself from a cost benefit point of view so certainly at the smaller end of the scale of construction i think the legal profession is seen as a last resort when things go wrong i don't think it's seen as somebody to engage with in the early days for uh, advice if you like and i think some of that is a perception about cost I think some of that is a perception about uh, the legal profession you know, being a bit formal, legal, for want of a better word. Um, and I think some of it is just a lack of uh, time on people's, uh, for people to say, well, I, and, and, you know, I want to set aside time to have those conversations. Um, certainly our experience and has been, and, and it's, I hope you do have thick skin, is that, that because... You, you guys are like Mr. Doom and Gloom because your job is to think about all the scenarios that may happen. Um, certainly our experience has been that it, you end up coming out of meters thinking, oh my God, we're never going to build anything here because th- this could happen and that could happen. And what if this happens and what if that happens and what if the other. And I think for the smaller companies or smaller operators within the industry who are not used to dealing with the legal profession, it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, and so I think there is a there is a um, I think that's one of the barriers for for, for smaller companies to get involved, without a doubt. Mm. Yeah. Thank you uh, on that, Dave. And I think that that certainly going to your last point, um, 
uh, 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 it's a real issue that the industry faces. And, you know, we often see people sort of dancing on the top of a pinhead and spending hours and hours and hours negotiating legal points, which in reality are unlikely to ever happen. And when they do happen, the, uh, uh, the way that it's dealt with in a contract can often not be suitable to fit the particular circumstance that has arisen. Um, but on this issue of, uh, uh, from your point of view, coming, as you said, on the, on the smaller projects, when you're looking at risk and whether that's risk that's being placed on you as consultants or risk on the um, contractor or the subcontractors, do you feel that there is a role for lawyers to play there um, in ensuring that that risk is properly placed? Or in your, ex well, uh, uh, let me just retract, just step back. I, I, in your experience, does that happen in practice? Um, uh, uh, is, is my question. Um. I think for for us, or for certainly for the, for talk, I mean, I don't want to become Mr. Small Project because we we do some bigger projects as well. But I think relative to to this award, we're it's a quite a small project. So uh, it, it, the, the the big issue comes down to cost benefit. So where you end up saying is you end up saying I know there's a risk there, but what's the likelihood of it happening, and can I afford? to pay a, a legal profession to give me some advice to mitigate against that risk. And the problem is there is undoubtedly a tipping point where the cost of that advice is worth it because the risk is either so high or so expensive. But I think for lots of things, it's uh, uh, the, the cost or the perceived cost by us, and maybe this is a question for you guys, the perceived cost by us it outweighs it. I think, and I, I don't want to sort of become the black sheep of the group, but, you know, the title of this is Conflict Resolution. The mere words that you're using at the beginning of this seminar sort of show a certain position that you're taking about what lawyers should be doing. Um, and so I think part of it is that perception of you're there to sort problems, not there to prevent problems in the first place. Mm. Um, and I think I, you know, look, in a previous life, I worked for a very big company and we dealt with lawyers all the time. And I lived in Taylor Westing's office in uh, Fetter Lane for about a year on a certain project. And I thought it was fascinating. And I loved working with those guys. But I think there is undoubtedly a perception at the, at the smaller end of the of the construction industry that you're you know that we don't really need your advice until things just get starts getting difficult and i don't know how we get around that i mean maybe it is things like this where you guys are talking about what you can bring to the party from a proactive team member collaborative point of view yeah indeed i i think um uh it is it is a challenge dave it, it, it's uh it, it's difficult and i understand it from your side and from from any client's side you have to justify the expenditure at any given point in time. Uh, I mean, just flipping that on its head, and it's a, it's a something we'll explore when we when we start posing some of the questions. But one of the things that we sat behind these desks sometimes feel is that we could have done more, or we could have been more efficient had we been engaged earlier. And so there's a tension there. As yeah. you say, we're, we're perceived as people who sort of come in and solve problems, which is partly correct. But we're also experts in, hopefully, dispute avoidance. You know, not, not just sorting out disputes once they've, once they've crystallized and become a big problem for, for you and the project. Mm. Okay. A any other views on, on the sort of overarching question? Um, uh, Ruari, I see you've got your your hand up. Thanks. Um, I suppose I, I wanted to just build on what Dave was saying and um, the question of conflict resolution. I think I think um, big picture, it, it's about avoiding conflict in the first place in terms of how contract terms are established and forgive me if this sounds glib but on, on the project that we submitted for um, the awards it used um, 
a particular procurement route, um, uh, an EC3 option um, C um, contracts in, um, in, in, a, in a procurement framework for the NHS where the same um, teams were um, within a, a relatively small pool um, delivering projects where I suppose the contractual relationship was more of, of partnering and working together, knowing that each project was significant in itself, but there was always another project. Um, and there was the value of a long-term relationship um, perhaps was more important than um, individual conflicts. So my, my point is that the, the, in, in, I, we were getting in a conversation to a point about how to be more proactive or at least get, I, I, I sense that in the conversation. Um, the, the more that can be done in the first place to define roles in a way that is going to be complementary to the entire team is, is how to avoid surely conflicts. And um, my, my, so, my sort of question back to yourselves um, from a legal point of view is when um, legal advice is being provided at an appointment stage, um, how, from a legal point of view, is judgment applied um, that an individual's an individual client's interests are not held to a point, an unrealistic point, that that inevitably creates conflict? Because a, you can only represent one client, and inevitably you have two clients in a contract. So how how do you apply the judgment? that conflict is not created um, in an appointment from day one? Yeah, well, I think that's a, um, uh, uh, that's a very good question. And it's something that we look at at the start of every construction project that we get involved in. And it seems to me that the starting point has to be to identify who is best to take on a particular risk and is that party able to manage it and those are open and frank discussions that should always take place before a project is started and before the contracts are signed up i don't think that it's of any benefit to the industry or to the project for employers or for main contractors with their supply chain simply passing it, passing off risk and dumping it on another party in the knowledge that that party cannot or may not be able to manage that risk. So I think that that has to be a starting point for any lawyer when they are looking at contractual obligations. And I think as much as you mentioned that there are two parties to a contract. Well, say for the sake of discussion, we're representing a client. My view is that it's not in the client's interest for us just to say, we will pass all of this off to another party because to a large extent, that's just kicking the can down the road. And it, 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 you know, placing a, a, an onerous an unreasonable risk on a third party. Um, uh, uh, there are financial consequences. That third party may not be able to perform the contract. So where does that leave the client? Also, if the client is passing off a risk, our view is that that risk is a commodity that should be purchased. And therefore, the, uh, uh, the party taking it on needs to be rewarded for it. Um, but it does, it, it, it does require a greater involvement than simply looking at standard terms and conditions, but really looking to understand what the objectives of the parties are and what they want to get out of this project. Um, and Andrew, I can see you've, uh, you've got your hand raised. Afternoon. 
Um, I, we took a slightly different approach to um, to contract management, and we actually engaged with a local legal firm to come in and do some seminars with the construction team to understand managing contracts. They they worked on mainly the JCT and the NEC3 contract that we work on. Um, so it was specific to what we were dealing with at the time. But we actually got together as a group with the local legal firm um, to discuss the contracts, how we should administer them properly, um, mainly to try and mitigate the risk that the company is taking on. Also give the guys that are working on the project the tools and the, the knowledge to then be able to in the event that we need to exercise the contract, we we know that we can in the right in the right manner. Um, ultimately, we want to avoid it, but I feel like that our team are better placed and will be more confident in what they're doing, having that knowledge behind them. Um, and, it, and it, in terms of cost-wise, it, it, it wasn't per person. It was it was reasonable. We felt to consider when you consider the risk of. Some of the the you know, multi-million pound projects that you know across a year that you can end up taking on, um, I think it, it very much stood us in a good good position. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's really good to hear, and I, and I think that it, it comes back to this, you know, bringing lawyers and the rest of the the project team a little bit closer together at an earlier stage, and it sounds like you built it into your your own sort of profession ongoing professional development as well, which is um, I think a really good idea. Um, but look, this this is a really good way to start the session. I, I see we're all already halfway through, and um, uh, uh, we've already started to talk about some of the topics and themes that um, that we'd sort of scripted. Um, so I'm going to hand back to David now, who who will take us through some of those questions, and and we'll make sure that uh, everyone on the panel has a has a chance to give their views. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I think we should stick on the. Uh, the topic that we've been discussing for a moment, and uh, uh, that, to some extent, was risk. Uh, so I think it would be helpful uh, uh, for us to share some views as to what we consider the industry's attitude to the allocation of risk is in reality. So I think we've... Um, uh, uh, We've heard from uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, people. Um, Jim, um, do you have any views on this in your uh, 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 Jeffrey Osborne world? That's it, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, obviously we like to have an open and collaborative approach uh, with all of our clients and I think in particularly doing a, a large project as we were during the pandemic. Um, it's amazing how collaborative you can become quite quickly. Um, obviously at RHS, we were in the midst of doing that project during Brexit. So one of the management tools that we used was the, the, the Brexit um, risk registers. Um, and we had close workshops with um the clients and the design teams and we shared that risk quite collaboratively at the beginning of the project um likewise when when uh, the pandemic struck again we worked collaboratively um and we shared that risk and it was very understood quickly between all of our supply chain and um, our consultants and our client so I think the open openness, uh, collaborative approach is is how we like to do things, um, and I think that is a good problem solving and a, and a fair way to, you know, share that risk. Um, you know, and at the at the beginning of the projects, we clear out. You know, we we and and tender stage, we do clearly, and, and as most people do, we we. We lay out on the table then the risks that we're willing to take um, and put back client risks as well. And ultimately, figures do get put to those risks, don't they? But they're not always palliatively <laughs> well received um, from a finance point of view. So that is something else that needs to be considered. Um, 
But no, I think we're quite, I like to feel that, you know, the projects that we're involved with, I think the openness and collaborative approach is the way to go and in sharing those risks. And the earlier we can engage within the projects and do that, I think the better for everyone. Yeah. No, I, 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 I certainly agree with that. And I think we've all obviously uh, lived through the pandemic and have experiences that have effectively come from that pandemic. Now, as a, uh, 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 as a legal team at Flagate, one of the first things that we did was to ensure that we all properly understood how the contracts dealt with COVID and what the implications were for time, what the implications were for loss and expense. And it was pretty clear that some contracts are better than others. The JCT contract, for example, didn't really provide much support or relief to the contractor other than offering a defence to liquidated damages. However, when we met with our clients, and this is mostly on the client side for the purposes of these discussions, I was extremely encouraged by the responses where, uh, and I think without exception, the general feeling was, let's put the contract to one side and let's see how we can get through this together. Yes, we may not be obligated to pay loss and expense, but if that's what is needed in order for this project to succeed, we will adopt an open mind. And that approach was actively encouraged by us. And during the course of last year, I came across one project that had a dispute over COVID. And, and these, are, these are major projects. And I thought it was remarkable the way that the industry pulled together in that, uh, uh, in that circumstances. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has uh, uh, different experiences uh, to that or whether we all agree that the industry dealt with it pragmatically and properly. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious it's uh, it, it's difficult with so many people on the panel. So I, I'm, I'm going to single people out now. But but if you uh, if you don't feel like answering it, there's there's absolutely no uh, uh, no pressure to do so. So uh, I mean, I'll, I'll go to Matthew at, at, at Ridge. Maybe you'd feel able to share some of your COVID um, uh, experiences. Yeah, I think generally um, generally agree, David. I mean, the one thing for us we noticed a difference in terms of um how contractors deal with covid on a jct contract versus an ec contract and yep. uh that was the big thing for us and this is just from 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 my experience for about seven or eight projects on site at that point in time that the jct contractors were back on site a lot quicker than the nec contractors and that again was down to the risk and and the, the t's and c's with the contracts I think I think generally, uh, um, I think the industry dealt with it fairly, and 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 it was all a moving thing for everybody at that point in time. So, but that would be the only thing I would I would highlight really that the, the sort of difference, slight difference in attitudes, I would say, in terms yeah. of the contract strategy. Well, that's and and that's a very interesting point, of course, because the NEC effectively treated COVID as a compensation event, and therefore there was, there was money associated with it, and the JCT didn't. So I think from what, from, from what you're saying, Matthew, is that to some extent, the JCT was of benefit to the industry because it ensured that the business of construction continued. And of course, that this was all in circumstances where the industry as a whole was being encouraged by government to get back to work and was one of the exceptions um, to the national lockdown. But of course, it was, and it, it, it's easy for me to sit in my office in uh, uh, central London and say this, and you guys were running these projects, but uh, it doesn't matter what the contract says. Um, uh, COVID had a material effect 
with mm. people having to self-isolate, with the risks, the worries, the dangers, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, I must say, sort of moving this slightly left field, I don't think the insurance industry has come out of this well. Um, uh, 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 certainly with uh, uh, delay, up and delay startup uh, uh, policies, which clearly uh, 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 cover pandemics. Um, uh, there's been an almighty scrap, and uh, uh, which some of you know ended up in the Supreme Court, but certainly on projects we've worked on, we still haven't see, seen any money flowing uh, uh, from the insurance industry through to the uh, 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 the individuals that took out those um, those policies. Um, great. Um, Chris, conscious of time, um, uh, I think we should um, bite the bullet and jump into uh, conflict and uh, and disputes. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's probably right. Um, so we we've talked about. Um, risk allocation, how we deal with it up front and, and how we deal with it day to day on the project. Um, um, but, you know, conflict, whilst not an inevitability, is a very real possibility on, on any project. Uh, and so we wanted to explore how people manage conflict on their projects um, and maybe, maybe ask some, some sort of searching questions about how we should manage conflict on projects so you know, are we doing everything right are there things we could do better and maybe share some experiences around that so 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 the first I suppose broad question to ask um, and I'll, I'll put it to a few of you is you know how should conflict be managed on a project so and, and by conflict I I don't confine that to things which end up in adjudication litigation or arbitration I I we're talking potentially about much lower level um, issues uh, where the party's interests aren't aligned and something needs to get sorted out. So how should conflict be managed on construction projects and, and by whom? Um, and uh, I, I'm going to put that one first to, um, should we go to Dale? Dale, we'll look next to Hello, am I on mute? Yeah. Hi there, guys. Um, to be totally honest, I've only been in sort of this role that's sort of dealt with these sort of things in one project. And I think what was really key with that project that went well um, is we had the time beforehand. I think a lot of this um, conflict stuff comes in where we've rushed to site. No one really knows accountabilities is, you know, as we were talking about risk being allocated early. Um, and I think for me, the biggest thing was communication. And I know we've talked about collaboration already, um, but we were in a really good position at Green School that we could get in the um, get onto site with a lot of this stuff discussed to depth, in depth, before we even got there. Mm -hmm. um, and I made a point of engaging everyone throughout the project to actually raise concerns earlier. So we, our personal experience with it is that worked, but it was only one project I've really been on. The new project I'm on now is pretty much the opposite, where we've we got into contract end of November last year. We had to be on site early Feb, and that was from stage to design. It's been an absolute rush, so there's a lot more risk allocated to it. So there are really conversations that are coming to the fore early um, through the collaboration um, that we need to discuss and resolve. So it's a slightly different approach to it all. But... I do think every job and every situation is unique because every team's different, every person's different, and every site's different. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I think it's it's interesting though, Dale, that uh, saying you, you'd only been really involved on, in this aspect of a project on one project, and yet you seem to have picked up on I think I think some of the some of the really key things with when it comes to managing and resolving conflict. Uh, and you mentioned early engagement, and I think that's. You know, that's absolutely key from my perspective. Um, uh, issues just can't and, and shouldn't be allowed to fester. Things only get more more difficult to resolve the longer they're, 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 they're left. Um, and so I, I suppose a, a, an interesting offshoot question to that is how, how do we how do we engage with our counterparties and project stakeholders um, earlier in in the process? How do we get 
lawyers engaged in a meaningful way, not not for the sake of getting lawyers involved to send stroppy, aggressive letters, but I mean getting lawyers involved to uh, advise on appropriate conflict management and dispute resolution strategies. Um, I mean, uh, Ben, Ben, do you have any any sort of any sort of views on that? Yes, hi, Chris. Yeah, I, I think so. I think almost what I could say is sort of summarising what a lot of people have said across the whole topics. And I think law, lawyers are a bit like an insurance policy. I mean, you, you need insurance, you need lawyers, but hopefully you don't need to use them all. Um, and, and the jobs go well and progress as they plan to. Um, I think first and foremost, I think get all project team parties involved, set some clear guidelines, set some clear targets, agree your objectives, um, agree the principles which you're trying to work to. I think if you can identify some roles and responsibilities quite clearly in the project, um, put clear methodologies in place on how you want to work and what, what you're sort of setting out to achieve. Again, like others have said, clear communication, regular reporting, um, avoid situations where there's no surprises, um, work closely, share, share information as soon as you're aware of potential items of risk, address those. Um, and for us, everything we do is tracked through sort of risk registers um, where we assign responsibilities um, and then and sort of try and control those on sort of weekly, fortnightly meetings. But if, but if in situations do occur where there are areas of conflict, I think you can go back to that sort of those benchmarks, those targets, you set the style of the project, go back to your sort of risk register where you assign responsibility. Very much in the case of not pointing a finger, you're a team at the end of the day. Um, and maybe opportunities you have to sort of resolve differences, look at how they can price, who, who can take ownership for those. But ultimately, you're in the project together. You all don't want to be saddled with costs and, and issues. Um, I think it's how you negotiate, bearing in mind for us as a contractor, we've been here for 144 years as a long-standing contractor. It's, it's about the long-term client relationships and not the short-term wins. And there may be some points you have to sort of come together and yeah, collectively share share items of pain that you may not otherwise want to do, but for the good of relationships and projects, um, just being open to work together, I think, is, is the right solution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some clear themes emerging here from what you said then and from what from what others have said so early engagement effective communication good record keeping and all of these things are of course important as well if if the worst comes to the worst and you can't resolve these disputes uh, commercially with the other side um all of these things are going to stand you in good stead if if you do need to go to a more formal dispute resolution process you know the mantra records 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 you know your 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 entire case and uh, any claim narrative is um is built around contemporaneous documents you can't overlook that um i suppose as from a from a lawyer's perspective as well the other thing to be mindful of yes early engagement good communication is is vital um but uh, beware the contract as well um you know we we see lots of contracts with time bar clauses condition precedents to relief and so not to lose sight of those yet yeah, yes collaboration is 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 going to be the way forward uh, in in 99% of the cases but it shouldn't be seen as an aggressive or confrontational step to send those notices and those letters saying well under the contract we have an entitlement and that can be set up in a way where it doesn't have to be uh confrontational um or aggressive so uh, I think that's the only thing I'd add to what's what's already been said on these points, um, which I suppose brings us on to the pr- pretty much the final thing we wanted to talk about, and we've touched on it already as well, which is you know, what role should we as the legal profession, and this is a chance for you as, as our clients um, and people who instruct um, solicitors, to say what role do you think we should be providing in um, managing and helping to resolve conflict? Uh, and I don't just mean coming in when, when you need lawyers to write letters before action, issue proceedings. Uh, I'm talking much earlier in the project life cycle, hopefully. And how, how we go about getting that earlier engagement, because all too often, I, I think it's fair to say that we, 
as David says, sat, sat here behind our desks in cent central London, um, feel that we, by the time an issue hits our desk, it's, it's not that it's too late, it, it's just become more difficult to solve. Um, so, uh, Martin, we, we haven't, uh, I don't think we've come to you yet, so do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think uh, that, you know, as, as we've discussed, sort of clear reporting is, um, is key when, when you're looking at any, uh, any, any, any risk here. Um, I think from, a, from our point of view, I agree with a few of the comments that we don't necessarily uh, engage with solicitors um, a lot of the time. But I think, you know, we have, um, as Andrew said, we, we've done a similar uh, sort of thing. We, we have engaged with um, solicitors to try and understand a little bit more prior to uh, contracts being set up. And I think that that's something for smaller companies that from before you get into that point of adjudication um, or issue, that there has been an advisory process from a solicitor to to sort of advise the smaller companies through those issues. I think that, that would that would help. Um, but just touching back on your last point with regards to, uh, you know, um, the, the reporting and everything else, communication is key for us with, with our projects. And, you know, we're very hands-on and very sort of customer-facing uh, all of the team here. So it's, it's, all about, um, it's all about that clear communication lines discussing uh, you know issues as they as they come up conflicts going to create problems on uh, problems are always going to occur on projects so it's about how you deal with them before you get to the uh, to the issue of um, uh, adjudication yeah yeah absolutely um ed do you, do you have a, a, any sort of views on, on on the role that the legal profession can play in in he helping to manage conflicts on projects hi there yeah so i think we um, we tend to get legal advice either if when we're going through a deed of appointment or a contract and there's any ambiguity or anything quirky that we feel like we need some guidance on and, and, and whether we then negotiate that with our employer um, and then the other is is in disputes and unfortunately 90% of our well, it's, we don't end up in any disputes, but and generally, I think should a conflict start to arise, as people have identified, it generally comes as a, as a consequence of a breakdown of communication. I think, and I would try to resolve it without legal input initially. Um, but there's been occasions, obviously, where the, it's hard to recover the the sort of rational communication uh, following the, the dispute and, and at that point it's it's really helpful to, to have the legal input so I think I mean we we have a, um, a legal advisor who is a fairly casual ongoing um, setup that we've got with them that we can sort of dip in and out and, and ask quite casual questions just for little snippets of, of guidance which is really helpful because it if it's something just a small that we need advice on uh, and we haven't got kind of the, the budget in the project to spend a lot on legal fees, then, then it, it, that seems to resolve it quite quickly. Um, and then I think there's a sort of a, a limitation on how many times we can do that over the course of the year. Um, yeah. I, I think that's really nice because it's not prohibitive to when you start to get out of your comfort zone, you, the, your your fee and your appointment isn't kind of limiting you, yourself getting the legal advice. Yeah, no, un, un, understood, and and, and I, I completely hear. And, and it's it, it is a, it is a barrier. It's a challenge. The the, the cost and the cost benefit mm. um, uh, of, of engaging lawyers earlier in the process. Um, but certainly, we you know we David and I think think that earlier engagement is is important. We think it's helpful. Um, and, and we, we sort of welcome your views on, on how we can do that in a, in a cost-effective um, way. Uh, are there any, any other sort of uh, thoughts? Does anyone else want to share any ideas on this? 
So I was, I was just going to add, I think from my perspective, I think it's almost, I know you mentioned, Chris, about how you get involved earlier on. I think it's very much about that. Understanding client drivers is a big thing. And I know we touched on it in terms of risk transfer. But I think sometimes it's, it's it can be easy in, in, my, in our experience where we have a lot of upfront dialogue with, with lawyers, where we get a set of standard amendments that come through that have, haven't really interpreted the client drivers. So we've we've encouraged over the last few projects to almost the lawyers to be almost become more of the team, yeah, and to be as part of those upfront discussions. So when we're discussing procurement strategies and we're looking at risk transfer, we're looking at cost certainty, program risk allocation, that it's all part of those discussions. So the the lawyers get to see where what the client wants out of it, what what risk they can allocate, what. What do they want in terms of cost? I think that's that's really key, and that that worked what worked really well for us on Cabby, and, and we've taken that as a bit of a lessons learned to make sure that we don't, as a as a consultant team, we don't do all of that up front and then get a lawyer in to do the amendments that they they feel part of the team, and that that's worked really well from from my experience. Well, that would certainly be 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 welcomed by by us, I think. Um, that earlier engagement, that that being part of the project team and not someone called upon, um, you know, at, at the eleventh hour for for some urgent advice. Um, mm. Look, this this is this has been re- really helpful, re- really informative discussion. Thank you uh, to everyone. We do have, I'm afraid, a hard stop at two p.m. because there are a number of these um, sessions going on throughout the afternoon. Um, uh, and so, apologies to those who put questions in the. Um, in the Q&A box, um, uh, as I don't think we're, we're going to have time in the next two minutes to uh, to deal with any of those. Um, so I'll, I'll just hand you back to uh, to David, really, for, for the summing up, and uh, we'll bring this session to a close. Well, I, uh, I would like to share and uh, echo your comments, uh, uh, Chris. I think this has been uh, extremely interesting and very helpful for us from where we sit uh, uh, in the industry, I think what I'm take what I will take away from this is that the legal profession is capable of providing assistance to the construction industry and to the the successful delivery of a project, but we don't always do that, and there are a number of reasons why uh, uh, we're too expensive. Um, we don't necessarily understand what the parties are seeking to achieve. Um, we don't get involved early enough. And I think equally important, the perception of lawyers is that we are there to effectively act as a confrontational um, uh, uh, arm to the industry rather than being of assistance in resolving disputes. So Chris and I will certainly take away from this conversation um, and uh, uh, we will hopefully uh, embrace these comments. I think the final thing I would say, and that it's not a defence to the legal profession, but we are one of a number of uh, uh, stakeholders in construction, uh, not least being banks and funders. And a lot of what we do, whether that is on behalf of contractors, whether that is on behalf of clients or the supply chain, is dictated and determined by the funding requirements. And bankers are risk averse, and therefore they drive a lot of the procurement routes and the liabilities and obligations. So perhaps a topic for another day is what does the banking industry bring to uh, construction? Uh, So I will, uh, uh, I think we are dead on two o'clock. So I think it just leaves me to say uh, uh, best of luck to everybody for the awards at 5.30 this evening. Thank you very much for participating, not only the panellists, but our external audience. Um, 
uh, uh, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.